Welcome to Competition Alternatives. I'm Ioannis Lianos, the founding director of the Center for Law, Economics and Society at UCL and professor of global competition law and public policy. The Competition Alternatives is an initiative to promote open discussion and outside-of-the-box thinking on all areas of competition law and policy, in particular in the context of the fourth industrial revolution. We are living in the era of digital platforms. The top five companies in the world in terms of capitalization are all technology platforms. The term platform may have different meanings in economics, business and engineering literature. As Annabel Gaver has wonderfully explained in a paper she published a few years ago on bridging differing perspectives on technological platforms, uh, economists and engineers take different perspectives in defining platforms. Economists focus on the multi-sided markets on which these platforms operate, the platforms mediating transactions across different consumer groups for which there exist indirect network externalities and feedback loops. Engineers view platforms as technological designs that help firms generate modular product innovation. I also believe that we can add the perspective of business literature, which examines platforms as a center of value networks. I've interviewed a number of leading specialists from law, economics, business and technology, exploring their views on the way digitalization and the emergence of digital platforms changes the competitive game and what could be the implications for competition law. Enjoy the discussion. Today was a great conference and uh, one of the things we spoke about was uh, the digital economy and the growing importance of so-called platforms in the digital economy. If we look at the top 10 um, uh, firms in the world today in terms of market capitalization, we will see that they're very different from what they were uh, 20 years ago and, 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 um, and even if you think about 50, 60 years ago. Between 50, 60 years ago and, and 20 years ago, it was pretty much the same kinds of firms. Big oil, um, uh, big manufacturing firms. Um, but what you see today is that out of the top firms, out of the top 10 firms, seven of them are uh, platform firms and five of them are American firms and two of them are Chinese firms. So the platform business model, the platform tech uh, firms are becoming increasingly uh, central to our economy and uh, a lot of people are getting slightly concerned about whether they are becoming too big, whether they are becoming too dominant and today's uh, conference looking at uh, competition law, uh, looking at these digital markets, is really looking at these, at these important issues. So um, the word platforms is uh, one of the most misused word um, in the past few years. It became a very fashionable world. If you think about the so-called unicorns, companies whose private valuation exceeds uh, $1 billion, a study that I've done recently shows that close to 80% of all unicorns define their own business as a digital platform. So clearly investors are betting on digital platforms to um, uh, become extremely successful. We've also heard the word network effects, which uh, talk about uh, how different um, uh, technologies become even more uh, attractive to new users if already we have a large install base. So we have network effects which create a self-fulfilling prophecy of success. And when we have network effects across different sides of the markets, such as if you think about, for example, Uber riders and Uber drivers, or Airbnb hosts and Airbnb people who want to rent uh, rooms or apartments, it's clear to see that if there are more people on one side, it's going to make the proposition more attractive to people on the other side. So you have again these um, self-fulfilling prophecies or this momentum and feedback loop that creates a viral growth and a lot of advantages to existing platforms. That makes them harder to dislodge. But some people have thought that just because you have network effects, that leads to a situation of winner take all. We do see a few markets where some companies seem to have a huge market share and they seem to be very difficult to dislodge. Google, for example, um, in search, 
and and uh, um, you know Facebook, for example, in social media. But it is not true that uh, these winner t these network effects always lead to a winner take all. And we have actually a number of examples of failed platforms which apparently were facing the same situations of network effects, but, but they did not succeed. So what does that tell us about, about competition policy? And what is the world of platforms? Uh, in what way should that inform competition policy? To understand that, we need to, um, we need to look a bit deeper into how platforms actually create value. And in my work, uh, and I have a new book coming out with Mike Cusumano from MIT and Dave Yoffe from, um, from Harvard Business School, The Business of Platforms, uh, that's the title of the book, we're looking at how platforms actually create value. And we identify two ways, we call them two platform types, in which platforms create value. And the first one has been well recognized by economists, and this is what we call a transaction platform. That's basically an intermediary that creates a connection or facilitates a connection between two different market sides. So think about, for example, Google. You have Google search, and on one side you're going to have users who are trying to get an answer to their search query, and on the other side you're going to have advertisers who are going to engage with Google because what they want really is through Google to get access to users. And what you have here are the ingredients for a platform business model. Uh, the, ing the ingredients that you need for a platform business model is this triangle, three actors, a platform in the middle, uh, side one and side two. If you only have two actors, a buyer and a seller, you don't have a platform business model. You have a traditional transaction. And a lot of our economic theory and our competition law um, apparatus, the economic apparatus, rests on this assumption that the basic unit of analysis should be the transaction between two players, whereas with platforms you actually have three players. And if you again revisit some of the deeply baked assumptions of competition law, as in with a lot of microeconomic analysis, it says that you need to look at dominance in the context of one existing market. And then you're looking at within that market whether or not a firm is acting in a way that is abusing a dominance which would, um, which, uh, which, uh, would be therefore contravening the law. The problem that we face when we are trying to force feed uh, 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 our, the situation we're trying to understand within this uh, apparatus is, I think, very fundamental. We used to be okay just looking at what happens within one market. It used to be a good enough understanding and you're looking at one firm behavior within one market and the boundaries between different markets, the boundaries between different industries were pretty stable. If you are in the newspaper market, you are in the newspaper market. And if you are in the retail business, you are in the retail business. And if you are in the toy uh, selling uh, market, that's what you do, you sell toys. But when we see now companies such as Amazon, for example, going from one industry to the next, to the next, to the next, uh, uh, with the usage and the very intelligent usage of, of all sorts of data, data which is generated by the end users themselves, revealing their preferences, data which they have, for example, about the transactions themselves, revealing what sells well and at what price. Uh, data seeps through the walls and goes under the doors and facilitates, uh, facilitates uh, the entry of those companies who have mastered the art of, of, of exploiting this new resource, which is this digital resource. Those companies have figured out that you can create a lot of value by linking together information that comes from disparate sources. So what we see now and what I suggest in my research is that it's actually important to look at the right level of analysis from an industrial perspective, which is not in this case just one market but looking at what I call the ecosystem. Myself, as well as a number of other scholars, have looked at this concept of ecosystem and we find it extremely promising if used rigorously, 
And uh, we have um, a recent article in the Strategic Management Journal with uh, Michael Jacobides and Carmelo Cenamo on uh, towards a theory of ecosystem, where we are proposing that ecosystem can be a very useful concept if we look at it rigorously and we look, I don't want to be too technical, about non-generic complementarities. So these are the ways in which different offerings are complementary. So to summarize, we used to be quite okay with our tools of economic analysis, which have informed competition law, looking at the level of the firm, transactions across firms, or transactions between a firm and a user, or and a consumer, where somebody buys something uh, and gives money to another actor in order to, to consume this particular, this particular good or service. And the interactions across firms happened within the, the, the safe um, uh, and enclosed borders of an industry defined as a market. Now we are moving towards a competition, a form of competition, and digital competition is affecting not just the tech sector, it's really affecting almost the whole economy. And in that kind of uh, business landscape, we need to realize that the important um, modality of competition is not that between two firms competing with each other, but between ecosystems competing with each other. And what those ecosystems are is more often than not, they have one powerful platform leader at their core, which, um, which is like the captain of an industry. So instead of having, I, would, I use the metaphor, instead of having competition between firms like a tennis player one against a tennis player two, I use the metaphor of a football. It's a team playing against a team. So if you are an application developer uh, that develops an app for Android, you are in the Android ecosystem. And if you develop an app for iOS, you are in that ecosystem. So we're seeing a change in the modality of competition of ecosystems against ecosystems. And when we see some firms which um, have an increasingly central role within what happens within ecosystem. And I will finish on one point, which is if we realize what is really happening is what we are seeing is that is the emergence of centralizing forms of power. And the centralizing force is that of the platform leader. Because if you think again, revisiting the, the fundamental ways in which platform create value, they create value by being central, by being a nexus of exchange. Or I talk also about innovation platforms, which are fundamental technological building block, a shared resource on top of which many firms and innovators can build new, 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 uh, new products and new services. And so transaction as well as innovations are the two ways in which platforms create value. And, and, um, and actually what we find in our work is that a few, num a few companies manage to do both, both transaction platform and innovation platform. And if you think about um, Apple, for example, they have the App Store, which is an innovation, uh, App Store, which is sorry, a transaction platform, and, and, uh, and iOS, which is a, an innovation platform. Or if you have Google, you have uh, uh, Google Play, which is a transaction platform, as well as uh, Android, which is a, an innovation platform. If you think about Amazon, they have Amazon Marketplace, which is an, a transaction platform, and uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services, an innovation platform. So those companies that are mastering the, the art of platform competition are really changing the rules of the game, not just in one market, but for the economy as a whole. And the definition of uh, uh, being pigeonholed into just focusing market by market is really missing the point. It's not really about looking if, for example, a company such as Google has a, a lot of uh, market share in the search market. That's almost besides the point. That's an entry point into a lot of, a lot of other markets. And you enter somewhere and then you use data to go from market to market. And you use, of course, you ride the, the, the wave of network effects, but it's not automatic. Some companies are much better than others at doing that. And therefore, it's a very fertile and very important area in, in, in business strategy, in economics, and in law.
One of the things that we spoke about today has to do with industry architectures. What is that? Well, part of the research that I've done over the last few years has been to study the way the sectors change, the different rules, roles and relationships in the sector. And I think that what you see has changed quite a bit over the last few years is uh, what each type of organization does. We don't have a neat way in which each market is easily defined banks, we know what they do, insurers, we know what they do, telcos, we know what they do. But you have a reorganization as a result of both changes in regulation and changes in technology, which leads to a change in these architectures. Why is this relevant? Well, it's relevant because the question of who does what also shaped who takes what. It's even more relevant in a competition and law uh, perspective because it affects the exercise of power. If you think about a number of the big uh, global firms that we still call tech firms, firms like Google, firms like Apple, they're not just selling the technology. What they're doing is that they're changing the way that their technology interfaces with all kinds of existing sectors, whether that has to do with entertainment, whether that has to do with financial services, increasingly the way that that has to do with health. So the impact that they have ranges well beyond the traditional remit. Why is the question of industry architecture relevant for people studying competition law? Well, it is because we are seeing now a new type of power, power that may be adversely affecting competition, which is the power of these firms that are changing the architecture of the sector and also quite often doing that by building ecosystems and platforms that are able to not only offer new variety to customers, but also create huge asymmetries. Consider, for instance, the way in which the growth of Booking.com with 8,000 employees has managed to make as much money as could the Group Accor with half a million employees because it's managed to be that bottleneck that stands between the customer and the choices the customer makes. Now, should we be worried about it? We should certainly start looking at that. So if you think about the tests that we have in terms of competition law, we should start saying, well, if we're going to see a merger or a new activity, a new initiative in an area, we should not only say, well, let me take the market for a given. Let me do our traditional analysis. Let me see what is the share of the market that you have. Let me do the usual tests. But you should say, is there any impact that that has in changing the architecture of the sector? Who are the others who are going to be adversely affected? Does that change, for instance, the ability of the others both to create and capture some power and also to be able to bring innovations to the table? The second thing that you can start looking at is the governance of these ecosystems. Think about all these big firms that have emerged, not only the Facebooks and Googles and Alibabas and Amazons, but also the uh, Ubers and the Airbnbs and all these other firms that rely on a network of firms managed by an orchestrator. We may want to start thinking about what are these principles th through which these ecosystems function. And part of my most recent work has been to understand these ecosystems and to say it's going to be useful for us to understand them to advise in terms of strategy. What is going to work for me as a company putting it together or joining one ecosystem or another? But also as society, because we may want to say, well, is there a minimum minimorum in terms of the rules of engagement between the hub of the ecosystem and the different spokes that we should consider expected or that we should start regulating? Why? Well, because the world is starting to move in this direction. We have already built an analytical arsenal that helps us understand the world one market at a time. But that, to me, looks like a hammer looking for a nail. The world has moved on. New forms have emerged. I think that what we need to do is to take a step back, consider the economics and the dynamics, the strategic dynamics of the sectors as they change, and then say, what are the right ways in which people will consider the translation of these dynamics into law and in which way should we consider the regulation of these activities.
I think there are a couple of different ways of approaching the question as, of, of whether um, digital markets are typically uh, winner takes all markets from a competitional perspective. I think one can look backwards uh, at digital markets and see how they have evolved over time and uh, history is replete with examples of uh, large tech companies who have succeeded in very dramatic and uh, prolific ways but then have subsequently failed quite quickly. Uh, Nokia, uh, MySpace, uh, a variety of, uh, of uh, eggs, Xerox, there's a, a long list of companies that have seem to have won the market but then as a matter of fact there's been a change in direction and, and things have, uh, have gone rather differently for them. So I think that's instructive when we think about whether moving forward these are winner takes all or winner takes most markets from a competitional perspective. Honing in a little on Google and our perspective view of where the threats come from, um, we tend to, uh, I, I think, think about that in, in two different ways. On the one hand, for our existing businesses, uh, what is the nature of, uh, of the competition and what do these competitors look like? Well, in an area like general search, what's interesting to me is that competition doesn't necessarily come from like-for-like -like competitors. It's uh, not necessarily uh, that a, a general search engine that does everything with Google will be Google's most <laughs> uh, um, uh, threatening competitor. And what we tend to see is that in some of the search queries, for example, that are most monetizable, um, areas like uh, travel and uh, retail, there you will find specialists who compete very vigorously with Google. And I think one of the most obvious examples is, of course, Amazon, who uh, Google sees as a, as a very serious threat for commercial, for retail type queries. So we see that kind of uh, a competition by specialism as, as a very real threat to, to Google's existing business. And the other way that I think that Google and other tech companies think about uh, competitive threats uh, as they look to the future is around technological shifts in the ways that consumers are interacting with uh, the products that we supply and the products that they sit on top of. And some good examples of technological shifts, I think, are there are obvious ones. The shift from a large mainframe computer to desktop computing, that's an obvious technological shift that affected competition in very dramatic ways. Um, uh, Microsoft was able to take advantage of that move, most obviously. But moving forward, you see the transition to smartphones and the use of applications rather than browsers signifies a very significant shift, I think, in the ways that consumers are using products and opportunities for new entrants and threats to the incumbents. Um, so those kinds of shifts also uh, make a big difference and pose a, a big threat to, to companies like Google and, and other tech companies who apparently today have these, uh, these unassailable positions. And, and that analysis can continue in many different directions. Voice search, uh, home assistance, all of these shifts in the ways that consumers will interact with technology and the way that the underlying technology itself will evolve provide multitudinous opportunities for new entrants, for threats, for the, uh, the overturning of what seem to be winner takes most or winner takes all positions. Well, the question of uh, whether I prefer uh, a new form of regulation um, that would apply to the digital sector or uh, the ev evolution of the existing rules um, is somewhat hard to answer because it really is a question of, of, of labels at that level. Uh, an evolution in competition law that is um, not predicated on any notion of needing to show a, a, a potential harm to consumers, of course, is rather unattractive to us. So too, regulation without any reasonable basis in a, in a concern that needs to be addressed. So for me, I think that the label is, 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 is less troubling. I think people tend to think of regulation as being more draconian. That's not obvious to me. Um, uh, but I think that what is more important to, to, to me is that the, the ways in which the rules evolve, whether they be competition rules or some new form of regulation, are done in a uh, meaningful and careful and thoughtful way. That, that means that we have identified very clearly a problem, a statement of a problem that needs to be addressed. That we have thought very carefully about the costs uh, of, in, of intervention, the costs of, of getting it wrong, uh, and the costs of missing some of those problems. And from there, if we have identified real problems that need to be addressed, that we have built the most uh, fit-for-purpose tools.
So really, I, I, I have no, no preference. I, I see the, the work that has been done to, uh, to conceive of platform regulation, uh, transparency rules, ways in which uh, platform companies, technological companies can give uh, more information to consumers and businesses. And I applaud it. I think those are laudable goals. Now, quite whether the, the goals can be achieved by way of writing down rules is a, is a, is a difficult exercise, but the intention, I think, is, um, is admirable. Uh, and so for me, it really makes little difference whether this is something that happens by way of a new regulation or whether we look to our competition or enforcers and, and, and see that what we need to do is to develop and evolve the analytical tools that they have at their disposal. It's much of a muchness. I can't say today that I can identify, if I'm asked to find a, a problem statement, a glaring hole that needs to be addressed, it's not immediately obvious to me that there is something there that requires um, a sort of root and branch change to the existing systems. Uh, the competition law rules and the competition law enforcers are uh, particularly sophisticated. Uh, they are very familiar with the types of businesses uh, that we operate at Google. And when they are not uh, particularly familiar, they have uh, sophisticated tools to collect information, to talk to us, to understand very well how these ecosystems and industries operate. So I think, you know, as the world is progressing today, better transparency by way of platform regulation, more sophisticated uh, investigations and analyses at the competition or regulators, I'm not seeing any obvious enforcement gaps. Um, is competition law up to the task uh, of dealing with platforms uh, and with some of the network effects? Uh, um, I think it's, the answer is complicated. Um, what platforms have created is systems where you have a combination of events. You do have network effects, uh, you do have a gateway uh, uh, function of the platform. You do have vertical integration and therefore a platform which is competing with its own suppliers of uh, or buyers of space or suppliers of content and I think it is the web, the combination of all this that we have to deal with in many platforms. Is competition up to this? Not really. Why? because uh, some of the concepts that we have, for example, the concept of a market, uh, is disrupted by the idea of platforms, because platforms do things that usually were made on regular markets, but they do it entirely differently. Even the notion of firm is different. Uh, second, uh, when it comes to assessing market power, for example, uh, we do have platforms that may have a zero price side and a positive price side. We don't really know how to do that. Uh, so we need to tailor uh, instruments in order to be able to tackle uh, those issues. Have we done a good job so far? I would say average. Uh, there have been lots of decisions by competition authorities that were using the traditional tools, uh, which were not really adapted to the situation of platforms uh, in general, or digital platform, or media platforms, and therefore were not uh, so good uh, from the point of view of analysis and the point of view of remedies. One of the difficulties of competition authorities, besides the tools, is that they need to develop knowledge of those platforms and how they work. Now, it's difficult because there is no established business model. Uh, the platforms use different business models and it changes all the time. So it is very difficult to understand. It requires people who are highly qualified and those people are in short supply in most competition authorities. Um, so those problems are complex because they're a combination of problems and they may require new instruments and they certainly require a deeper understanding of the platform economies. The reason for which platforms are able to capture a lot of the value uh, 
if you think, for example, of a digital media platform, uh, is because it has made the distribution of content so powerful and so cheap that every producer of content has to go to the platform. As a result, the platform becomes kind of a monopsonist. And on top of this, the platform has the ability to integrate vertically, to produce its own content, and therefore to compete with the content providers. Okay. So this combination of things, where the platform is the gateway to the consumers, is the best way to distribute, uh, but at the same time is a potential competitor, uh, has given an enormous amount of power to the buyers of the content, uh, to the digital platform. Um, there are issues about whether this has weakened the media industry because uh, they have not gotten enough money uh, to produce the news as they used to or produce content as they used to. Um, and the question is then, if the platforms replace them, will we have the diversity that we had when we had uh, the traditional content providers? Uh, so I think it is not only an issue of competition, it is also an issue on, if you think about pluralism of the uh, content producers, it is also an issue. So we are at the border between antitrust and more democratic uh, uh, ideas about uh, content uh, production. So from that point of view, I think that yes, we should be a little bit concerned about this because the production of content is certainly a commercial enterprise, but it also has a social value. So we have a collective interest in having a vibrant, effective content producing industry. Uh, so I think there is an externality there which we want to be uh, uh, concerned about. Whether we can solve this purely by using competition law, I'm not so sure. Uh, so there might be some regulation that could be necessary to protect to a certain extent content providers against too much power on the, on the buying side uh, from the platforms. So what, how can we and what are the issues with integrating, for example, privacy into the antitrust analysis? And we know that there are uh, serious concerns about the privacy of the data of consumers, uh, uh, for example, and how they are used by platforms. And they are used by platforms in such a way that they can do two things. Uh, on the one hand, they can provide those data sometimes uh, in not, not very transparent conditions, uh, to advertisers so that those advertisers can better target uh, their advertising to the specific needs of the consumers. Um, but they also can use this information to, in fact, to tweak competition or to, to uh, uh, restrict competition between them and advertiser who have integrated, I mean, who are producing the same kind of services that they uh, are producing. Okay. Um, so far, competition authorities have had a difficult time integrating, uh, or knowing how to integrate the notion of data privacy in traditional antitrust analysis. Some people have said, well, data is really an implicit price that the consumers pay, so we should integrate this in the price uh, and we should treat this as, uh, uh, as we treat uh, prices uh, in general. Others have said, no, privacy is more like a quality dimension and therefore a degradation of the privacy is more like a degradation of the performance or the, of the quality uh, of the product. Um, and others have said there should be privacy laws, but they have nothing to do with the competition. The problem is that they do have something to do with competition because they are mechanisms through which the use of personal data uh, of uh, consumers can affect competition, either between platform or even between uh, the advertisers' uh, uh, platforms. So I think that we will have what we have is to come up with new theories of harm that will integrate this in the classical context uh, that we have. For this, we have to be very clear on what the mechanisms are uh, 
uh, through which data can lead to a reduction in the competition. And possibly uh, there should be, but I would say outside of competition law, the creation of a right for consumers to control their own private data. Uh, there are tendencies uh, uh, in that direction. Uh, the, this is a source of concern. I think that this is outside the scope of competition law, but I see it as a complement to competition law. If we only think about competition law, we have to be more clear about what are the scenarios through which the use of private data can affect markets. And so far, we have not been entirely clear. I mean, there are several options, and there hasn't been yet uh, I would say on the part of the economist, uh, a sufficiently clear signal of what would make sense. I'm delighted to be here and uh, uh, about your question, uh, Italy uh, adopts uh, uh, the uh, mm, dual responsibilities uh, uh, model. Uh, that means uh, that uh, the Italian Competition Authority deals uh, with the enforcement of antitrust and consumer protection rules. Uh, adopting a case-by-case ex-post case um, approach and the Italian regulator in the TLC uh, sector, uh, AGICOM, uh, deals of course with uh, regulation of uh, the sector. However, the two tracks are not entirely parallel. Uh, I mean, uh, on one hand, uh, um, the um, mechanism for cooperation between the two institutions uh, have been put in place. And on the other hand, uh, the Italian regulators uh, take uh, an antitrust approach in uh, his task in order uh, to um, implement pluralism uh, on the markets, on the TLC uh, markets. Uh, all in all, uh, the regulator um, strikes the balance uh, among the different and uh, often conflicting interests other than competition on the TLC markets. Uh, and as for uh, the Italian Competition Authority, the public enforcers, the key mechanism uh, to um, introduce uh, uh, into public interest other than competition in the decision-making process is, uh, in my opinion, the proportionality uh, principle. And, uh, and I think, uh, as a conclusion, I think that uh, um, uh, competition, national competition authorities um, have uh, a role, an important role, to uh, play uh, on digital markets uh, they have uh, uh, um, a good toolkit uh, uh, to be used to play this role and uh, uh, that in this uh, transitional period uh, the uh, enforcement may be uh, uh, more suitable than uh, more flexible than regulation uh, to deal with uh, the issue at uh, stake and uh, uh, Competition authorities having a dual uh, competence uh, um, in uh, um, antitrust enforcement as well as uh, uh, consumer protection are, in my opinion, the best situated uh, to uh, tackle the issue. In the United States, we've had a natural experiment with the consumer welfare standard for the past 35 years. And although there's still some debate, I, I say it's like debating global warming, given the amount of evidence that we have now is that consumer welfare has not necessarily benefited consumers, nor is it concerned about consumers, nor is it necessarily concerned about their welfare. And 
One can question the effectiveness of the consumer welfare standard on several different fronts in the brick and mortar economy. I don't think it's going to necessarily now miraculously work well as we move into the digital economy. So there are multiple problems with the consumer welfare standard that we identify in a paper, the effective um, competition standard. And even though some say, well, it's just a matter of, of enforcement, it's, it's a question of tinkering and at the margins, we're a lot more uh, suspect. And so what we're arguing is that at a minimum, we should have an effective competition standard, that Congress should now intervene, and that we need to be aware that the digital economy is going to raise even more problems that are going to tax than the price-centric tools that we have under the old consumer welfare standard. So now the question is, what do we do next? Uh, so I was testifying before the Canadian House of Commons and one of the members said, give me three specific policy proposals to deal with these data dataopolis. And he caught me a little bit flat-footed because while we've been identifying the risks, no one has provided yet policymakers a framework on how to address them. But based on my discussions and, and also the research up to this point, I think we can come to several conclusions right now at this point. Number one, there is no silver bullet that this is not an area that competition law can fix, privacy, or consumer protection. It's going to involve coordination among many different policies. And it's not necessarily going to always, there may be a competition problem, but not necessarily a competition law resolution. It might have to be addressed through some other measure. The second thing what we could identify is that it's not going to be one agency or even one jurisdiction that this, and then this is one of the nice things about having this conference today and having so many different panelists from around the world, including South Africa, is to show how we need to then work on a global, um, not necessarily solution, but at least a global dialogue on how do we address this problem. And then the third thing that I, and the third and final thing that uh, we can all agree on is that it's not going to necessarily be ex post such as more privacy enforcement or more um, antitrust enforcement after the fact. I think what we're increasingly recognizing is that there has to be ex ante measures, more along the lines like the GDPR, but maybe different because we're going to have an experiment with that. But what are the necessary preconditions in order to have an inclusive economy that protects the citizens' well-beings and, as this conference has pointed out, can help promote a healthy democracy. So those three guiding principles, I think, will now take the debate in the next few years to come. Okay, so the issue is whether antitrust is up to dealing with markets in which winners take most or all in some cases. Uh, and, and the answer is, first of all, uh, it depends a lot on the market because some markets are homogenous, like search engines tend to be all alike, and then you do have a problem of winners taking all or most. Other ones are subject to a lot of product differentiation. I'll give you a good example. Without any substantial uh, intervention by competition authorities, Dating websites are quite diverse. There's quite a few of them. And the reason they're quite diverse is because they cater to different tastes. They offer different kinds of products from long-term relationships to pure sex. They have religious specialties. Uh, they, some cater to people who are older and so. And I think to the extent we can encourage more product differentiation in these markets, we can create a situation where there will be room for more than one uh, seller. Now, does antitrust have a role to play in that? Well, I think probably a limited one, uh, but it should certainly be one that uh, 
condemns mergers that threaten to reduce the amount of diversity in in um, in websites, uh, and uh, and also that pursue various types of ex exclusive licensing that might prohibit uh, differentiated products from coming into the market. Okay, so the, so the question is, what can antitrust do about the problem of monopsony and wage suppression in labor markets? And here I think the answer is they can do quite a lot. Uh, number one, realize that labor market concentration is a problem and using tools we've recently developed for defining labor markets, it turns out labor markets are, if anything, more concentrated than many uh, product markets. Secondly, then, we should use the merger laws to go after uh, markets that threaten increased concentration in labor markets. And in particular, we should use the antitrust laws to go after practices that limit labor mo mobility. The most serious of those is non-competition agreements, which are basically agreements that restrain uh, employees from moving from one firm to another. Historically, they were justified under the theory that uh, they protected intellectual property rights or prevented free riding, uh, protected uh, con customer lists and things like that, but their use has proliferated way beyond that. For example, there's a, a case in the U.S. right now uh, concerning non-competition agreements in, in McDonald's, which is a fast food franchise, which extends all the way down to employees who are barely paid the minimum wage. They, uh, you know, they flip hamburgers, they clean the building, and so on. They don't have any kind of skill uh, that would justify a non-competition agreement, but nevertheless, McDonald's appears to be using that as a way of limiting the ability of workers to go from one, one job to another. So the question is, to what extent can antitrust do something about the market definition issue uh, in a case that involves a two-sided platform in which the court held that the market should include both sides, okay? First of all, I think that the Supreme Court was incorrect in that view. The market should have been defined as one side. There may have been effects from another part, another area, but we don't deal with that by defining buyers and sellers into the same market. As a result, I think the market definition question should be narrowly construed. Secondly, the court itself gave uh, some pretty strict uh, elements uh, for its market definition, which is that there be one-to-one -one and simultaneous transactions between the parties. That would be true of a credit card. So the buyer puts down the card, the card passes through the platform, and the merchant uh, advances the purchase and pays the fee, and all of that happens at exactly the same time. Uber would be another example of a simultaneous two-sided transaction where the rider, uh, by engaging Uber on the platform, pays the fee, Uber transfers the money less the service charge to the driver, and so on. Most platforms don't involve one-to-one -one simultaneous transactions. For example, uh, magazines and newspapers that accept advertising, there's no transaction between the reader and the advertiser. Uh, they don't, they're not buying or the advertising, and so that, that kind of transaction doesn't exist. Same thing is true in insurance platforms. In the U.S., a lot of health insurance is sold through platforms, but there, there's not a one-to-one -one transaction either. There's actually an actuarial relationship between what the uh, patient purchases which is usually a monthly insurance premium, $300 a month or something, and then on the selling side, the doctor or group sells medical services on a fee-for-service basis, but there's no one-to-one -one, uh, There's no one -to -one correspondence. In my view, none of those fall into the uh, Amex uh, two-sided market definition.
thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. And, and I think the, the issue of winner take most um, is, is really central to our understanding of the dynamics of competition. When we look at the digitalized environment, we all get the sense that we have a truly dynamic environment with a lot of innovation. And that is indeed the case. Uh, all of us benefit immensely from that environment. But one interesting element of that environment is that because markets tend to tip due to network effects, um, due to uh, extreme power, due to gatekeepers, we're starting to see an environment that still has a lot of the characteristics of an innovative environment and quite dynamic, but in which, as some may say, competition is for losers. And what do I mean by that? The winners of the competitions, those uh, that benefits from the market power, are to some extent, extent uh, insulated from the true pressure of competition. And that's something for us to worry about. It has impact at various levels. It affects us when we think about innovation, because it means that they can direct uh, the paths of innovation, they can prevent certain types of innovation from emerging, and they can purchase the disruptors, those who have innovation that does not run in line with their interests. It is relevant when we think about market entry because those will allow you to enter as long as you're part of the ecosystem that they run. As long as you are feeding the data ecosystem, the analytical ecosystem, but they can also block you. It affects, of course, as part of entry, the barriers to entry. It affects pricing. It affects choice. So these are elements that are important to us. And yet, from a competitional perspective, they're very challenging because we have developed over, a, over the years a system which is very much price centric. Our tools primarily work with pricing. Um, and there is a good reason for that. Um, it is an objective, easy to follow, easy to quantify uh, benchmark. And now in this new system, where prices tend to be zero, uh, in this new system where everything appears to be quite dynamic, we need to adjust. It's not about adjusting the laws, but it is about adjusting our perception of the market. It is about changing, to some extent, our understanding of dynamics, our understanding of the process of competition. And here it requires us to focus much more on quality, quality degradation, on qualitative elements that are part of the competition process, but are much harder for us to work with. And this is why uh, we hear more and more voices that competition law enforcement fails to address some of the concerns that we have when it comes to um, the type of environment that we have, how, uh, how much choice we have, whether the markets are uh, sufficiently open to new competition. And the issue, therefore, is not so much the inadequacy of the law as much as the processes that we are very good at implementing, not necessarily hitting all the data points, the relevant elements that are crucial uh, for our understanding of this environment. So it's a very interesting question, trying to identify what is the scope of competition law and what are the limits of competition law. And this is something that has been uh, now in recent years uh, very prominent in public discussion. And BEUC, the European Consumer Association, is conducting now a um, study and initiative that is looking into that. And when you face our, or when you confront our competition tools with a digitalized environment, it just brings out all the inadequacies and the limitations of, of that tool and helps us try and understand what are the best ways to, to deal with digitalized market. So to begin with, we know that when we look at competition regimes worldwide, we have to understand them in the national and social context. While many competition regimes around the world share the same DNA, we all speak very similar language and we rely on very similar economic analysis. They do represent different ethos. Some of them are more norm-based, some are more economic in their application. In Europe, competition law is about consumer welfare, is about consumer well-being, it's about fairness, it's about maintaining markets that are not distorted. So we have a range of goals and values that play a role here. 
and all these ranges goal range uh, all this range of goals provides us with a relatively flexible tool and that tool can become quite important when we deal with the dynamics of digital markets it is important because it may provide us with a very good and flexible basis to deal on a case-by-case -case level with issues such as distorting information flows uh, issues such as tracking personalized pricing, behavioral discrimination, uh, stories that involved um, foreclosing the market, but not in the traditional sense, by creating friction, by distorting the process of competition. So these are elements that at least in principle we can cope with. The problem, of course, is when you translate it from a more conceptual level into a workable benchmark. And here I think we all appreciate that there are real challenges. And this is where it is important to distinguish between our ability to identify a competition problem and our reflection on the available toolbox. While we may speak a competition language, not all remedies should be competition. So within competition we have ex ante and ex post, and I would personally argue that in a digitalized environment ex ante should receive most of the attention because it is about creating incentives for the undertakings operating on the market to work in a way that represents our interests. But we also have privacy and we have data protection and we have consumer empowerment. So we can have a much wider toolbox that um, your narrow traditional competition toolbox. And this is why personally, I don't think we should be afraid of discussing things as a competition problem, as long as we remember that it is possible that competition might not be the uh, optimal tool for a certain task. And it is possible that what we need to see is greater cooperation between various agencies, various regulations, and more intelligent regulation. Regulation that uh, understands that in dynamic markets we have to be very careful. The risk of over-intervention is real, just as the risk of under-intervention. So we have to be very careful in trying to create all the incentives, but refrain from overdoing it. Well, thank you for inviting me, Johannes. Uh, it's a pleasure. So I'm, uh, I do work for a media company in, um, on the legal side. So I actually try to spend uh, time understanding the, the issues related to media companies and understanding the framework that w needs to be developed. And I say needs to because I think the current um, situations need a, like a new approach. Um, so to some context on the issues, I mean, there's really a decrease in the number of journalists today uh, in the U.S. in the past 15 years from 60,000 to 45,000. And, uh, and also something that we heard for many years was that the publishers need to find their business model. So pure players uh, only on uh, the Internet were doing better. But it's not true today, actually. Today the traffic goes uh, a lot to traditional media that have uh, open uh, web pages. Uh, and everybody is not doing great. That is the reality. Um, where the competition interacts, competition law interacts with these issues? Well, it's very interesting because when you look at what's happening horizontally in plurality of media, and we have some set laws and regulations in many countries on that, there's actually a fair amount of competition. There's a fair amount of newspapers at national level, and now there's a lot of uh, publications online. And you could actually say that choice exists for consumers. What we fail to understand is that increasingly, the production of news is separated from the curation of news. Increasingly, there's only a limited uh, avenues for distribution of news on the internet. And there's a duopoly in the distribution of news referral sources for on the internet. And so although newspapers create a lot of surplus for their consumers and for advertisers and for um, the societies because they play a role as a fourth estate, uh, the surplus is now captured by the distributors. And the other problem, which is on the back end is there's also a lot of surplus created in the targeted uh, programmatic advertising system, but uh, a lot of people are looking at it now and find that these 
the surplus created in this system is captured by also a, a duopoly. So that's where I think competition law needs to interact and understand these dynamics. So I'm familiar with this question and uh, even more since I practice in the US where we uh, authorities really look at exclusionary conduct in a horizontal sort of competition way. So I think uh, three things. First of all, um, and we've made submissions, uh, my company News Corp, in, in different jurisdictions. Basically, the, the way competition law needs to evolve is looking at ecosystem and what's happening in general. It's very hard, challenging, to make a direct co co connection between a specific format in which we're construed uh, online and uh, the loss of advertising revenues and the loss of attention, which is basically what we generate through content. But in, if you look at the entire ecosystem, you can see a shift of dollar amounts from advertisers to, uh, from sorry, from publishers to platforms, and advertising prices went up. Um, but again, it goes a lot to the intermediaries, not to publishers. So I think you need to look at several conducts and the way they impact an entire ecosystem. That being said, um, there's two markets where I think we can, authorities can focus and it's uh, access to online news or access to news articles online. To my point, publishers produce the articles, but more and more the articles are accessed on other platforms. And I think there's a form of competition for direct traffic and indirect traffic, and they are together competing. And the story you see is that publishers, by being forced into certain formats, uh, so instant articles for Facebook, for example, they then uh, have to give away their content for free and they lose direct traffic. And this is bad for publishers, but it's also bad for consumers as they lose access to like the provenance of news. There's some study, the consumers on when they access articles indirectly, lose basically the ability to recognize a brand and the ability to know if they should trust the content. Uh, in terms, the other one where I think um, authorities should look at is digital advertising, uh, because it's a very, very complex black box, as we heard this morning. I wouldn't go into the details right now, but this black box needs to be uh, looked at. And we publishers can only say so much because we do not have all the data. Um, yes, indeed. In many markets, uh, you typically distinguish between buyers and sellers, which is of course uh, correct because there are buyers uh, and sellers, and then we analyze buyer power or seller power. Now we have these um, uh, new platforms that are uh, ser serving as an intermediary, so they inter have an intermediation service. Um, which is different from classical intermediation because they don't buy stuff and then sell it on, uh, but rather bring sellers and buyers together. And under competition law, typically these markets are, de are defined as seller markets because they, Amazon is selling you a service. So even if you are a, a merchant, then they sell you access to the Amazon world, so to say, or access to the consumer. And so they are not buying anything really. And typically seller markets are quite differently analyzed than buyer markets. Uh, buyer power we know has a lot of to do with uh, outside options negotiations and so on. And uh, we think in this particular situation often merchants or manufacturers are similarly dependent on Amazon as they would have been in a different intermediation world to, to, with respect to a classical buyer. So we think in this situation Amazon is something more like a, a buyer in a seller market, which sounds strange, but it's more like they have buyer power even though they are not buying anything. And we think this could be captured if we say this is intermediation power. They, Even though they don't buy stuff from you, the manufacturer may face the same level of dependency from Amazon as if this was a buyer. So this is hopefully somewhat understandable what we mean with intermediation power. <laughs> 
Yeah, in fact, we've we've seen uh, quite some regulatory movements in the uh, along the food chain in the food industry, um, and it probably has to do to some degree because people were unhappy with the way the competition law or antitrust uh, law had developed and felt that certain practices could not be captured by antitrust. Uh, in Germany, actually, we had a different development. Um, we didn't see the necess necessity for this type of regulation because competition law was stricter from the beginning on. So there is this particular concept of relative market power or also dependency. That means even non-dominant firms who are relative strong, have relative market power vis-a-vis -vis the other party, uh, are not allowed to do what they would be allowed to do if they were small, uh, let's say. so. Certain type of practices are, in that sense, regulated by competition law already, which means that we don't need this additional regulation. On the European level now, we don't have this concept yet of relative market power and dependency, and this explains why we see this additional regulation instead of competition law. And in fact, if in in vertical uh, relations in digital markets, we have more or less the same problems, uh, actually, in some of them, uh, at least. So I think there are two options. Either we try to beef up competition law, or we will move probably to a regulatory world. My inclination would be rather try to make competition law work uh, better, but if that fails, then probably we will see more regulation. When you deal with a market where it is said that the winner takes all, um, for me the key question is, did the winner take all on the merits or did the winner take all because of restrictive practices? If the winner takes all for the merit, on, on the merits, he deserves to take all, but that is not uh, a blanco check. He should then continue to behave properly and we should be able to see whether he abuses the uh, uh, dominance, because if you take all, you can be assumed to be dominant, um, whether he uh, abuses or not that dominance. And, but I th really think that we do have the, the necessary legal uh, instruments to, uh, to, do, to deal with that. I don't think that privacy issues as such should be dealt with by competition authorities. Uh, they should be dealt with by the data protection authorities, and we all have one or should have one under the GDPR uh, legislation. But that doesn't mean that infringements of the privacy rules can never be a, a competition concern. Take the example of a dominant company that not occasionally, accidentally, ignores the privacy rules, but systematically that may well create a particularly unfair competitive advantage in compared with the others who apply the law as they should. That can create a distortion of competition which goes beyond the difficulties in competition which inevitably follow from the dominance uh, that should be taken into account by competition authorities. The implication of uh, digitalization uh, for uh, antitrust enforcement, I think, need to be thought through quite carefully. I don't think that we have issues with digital particularly or with tech in particular. There is often a uh, misunderstanding or a misstatement that there is a question of um, application of the rules in the digital world. I think we don't have a problem with the digital world. We know that uh, uh, platforms, if you want to call them that, have a particular economic properties, characteristics, network effects, uh, different business model, monetization that occurs in different ways. Um, all of that is true, but uh, it isn't something we cannot deal with. It is something we understand. We've understood the economics of two-sided platforms for some time. Where I think uh, the uh, policy and the enforcement need to be so through and revamped is we, we uh, are faced with certain phenomena that we didn't quite expect. Certain things we knew and we expected. Other things we didn't expect. We thought that in the digital world we were sold this idea that the digital world was going to be this world of seamless 
um, downloading, multi-choice, uh, people multi-homing, differentiation, leapfrogging, um, and uh, that market power is only transient uh, as a result of this. In reality, what we are observing is that ma market power for certain platforms is uh, become very strong. And frankly, in some cases, in some market, um, the market is tipped already. We're no longer thinking about what can prevent tipping. We are thinking, we've tipped. We've tipped in search, we've tipped in social networks. We may have tipped in retail, um, internet retail. And so at that point, we don't have a broad question or problem with, uh, with tech. I don't have a problem with Uber or Airbnb or any of those. We understand what to, to, to think of them, but you have a, a limited set of situations in which you have very obvious, clear, established, persistent market power. Um, attention of consumers is channeled in two or three main funnels. And people are not actually, for behavioral reason or whatever, moving along. Competition is not just a click away. It could be, but it isn't. And so I think the challenges that uh, this poses is to think uh, through what the implications are both in mergers and in conduct. In mergers, I think we should rethink the way in which we look at uh, market power, the ways in which we measure uh, market power is, is obsolete. We don't really think about how these, comp these, these platforms interact and, and the ways in which uh, the, the, a merger could have an impact on, on, on attention, um, attention space for consumers. So that is an area where we certainly should think more. And I think the whole area of um, looking into nascent competitors, acquisition of nascent competitors requires a lot of thinking. Uh, I would be in favor of quite aggressive uh, enforcement against those deals, which, by the way, are not the majority or the totality of deals. I don't have a problem with an acquisition of a nascent company uh, by someone who is not super dominant. When somebody is super dominant and prices that are being paid are very, are very uh, obviously high, then I would suggest that we need to look into that. And there are reasons we could even decide to block a deal. Um, we can look into the, the crystal ball a bit, but I think the downside of doing that is not that large. I don't worry about that undermining incentives for innovation. I don't worry about type two errors. I think we have been too paralyzed by the worry of type two errors to do anything meaningful in this space. And to conclude, I think in conduct, much the same message applies. We've been too uh, worried about type two errors and we've been too worried about applying theories of harm that have t t tried to test it because we have a common law structure in competition law. We should be a lot more imaginative and creative in terms of using the tools that are there. They've just been underutilized. Things like exploitative abuse. It's in the rubric. We never do it. It's been totally forgotten. In reality, what happens in a number of these markets is unfair bargains are being struck at the level of consumer, at the level of users, at the level of firms, because of the power of the platform. And so that is something we should consider looking into that. Um, so I, I, and, and I think we should move more quickly and do more interim measures, because unless we do that, we are losing completely the ground, and we're going to find regulation overtakes antitrust, and rightly so, because if we're not able to do anything, then we don't. So that's my view. I think it's important to distinguish what is specifically digital about the issues. Because otherwise, there's too much of a tendency to say, oh, you know, we're in the digital era, and now everything has changed. In my mind, there are three dimensions that are typically digital. The first one is the growing importance of data. It's because we have digital technology that we can gather and analyze data much faster and much better than before. Another one is algorithm, who means Digital means software, means algorithm. And we see that that has consequences for competition policy. The third one is an old thing that has to do with territorial restraint. That's nothing new about that. But for decades, we've been dealing with territorial restraint and antitrust by relying on the distinction between active and passive sales. So the problem is that in the presence of digital, where the consumers can log onto your site from anywhere in the planet, this distinction no longer works. And we've seen in the recent investigation of 
territorial restriction in the digital industry, like in the video industry and in the broadcasting industries, that we have not solved this problem yet. Moving back to the other two issues, let's first look at algorithms. I think there are two dimensions of algorithms that are important. The first one, which has been you know, pushed and, uh, and discussed by Professor Ezraghi, is the fact that by using algorithm on the marketplace, firms might be able to tacitly collude much more effectively than before and with less of a probability of being detected as before. The idea being that they can detect kind of cheating from implicit agreement very fast and can retaliate very fast. This clearly is a concern. I think one can exaggerate this concern because digital also makes it possible for you, for example, if you want to cheat, to have an algorithm that your competitors see and hide an algorithm that you actually use. So the net effect is actually not quite clear, but this is definitely something that one should investigate. From the point of view, I think that I remember from my last visit there, that the Russian authority actually has a bunch of spe specialists that already kind of patrol the internet a little bit to kind of look at possible collusive behavior based on algorithm competition. The second implication is quite different. That has to do with things like you know, Google platforms and so on. In those platforms, there are lots of algorithms that do the search, that determine which advertiser gets placed where and so on. These are complex. And the problem there is not one of collusion. The problem is that they're so complex, the competition authority have so little expertise in that, that it is hard to determine whether, first whether some abusive behavior is taking place, and second, if one has found abusive behavior, it's hard to determine remedies that could not be kind of worked around very simply by just modifying an algorithm. So in that sense, we will need, actually, uh, some more expertise uh, there. And then there is data. And again, one can exaggerate the importance of big data. At some point, there are decreasing returns. We know that in some dimension, like search, the returns do not decrease very fast. In other dimension, I suppose, like having you know, uh, uh, clients for Amazon, I would suspect that the economies of scale linked to big data are, uh, get uh, exhausted much faster than that. But I think the main point about big data is a point made by Thomas Valetti and Andrea Pratt, is that in this competitive space where data is used, the competition, in some sense, is for the time of consumers, and is for eyeballs, if you want. And in this context, even if you have kind of data that do not overlap, so I have a data set, you have a data set, so there's no overlap, so I'm not increasing my monopoly power on data in any way by merging, I'm still increasing my hold on the time of a relevant population. And this might call for a kind of different way of looking uh, at mergers. 